Good morning. Welcome to Point Pleasant United Methodist Church. Want to welcome you this morning. Want to welcome those folks that are here in the building. Make yourselves known. Yeah, we got a few folks. That's right. Even in the midst of the pandemic and the smoke, we actually have a pretty, pretty cool system of moving air through here um, so that folks can be where they need to be, whatever works for them. I also want to begin with our first announcement, which is um, we, uh, we're moving into a time where uh, the vaccines are, are, are making a huge, a huge effect upon the pandemic, but not everyone's vaccinated. And even if you are vaccinated, unfortunately, this Delta virus, it's possible, much less likely, but still possible that you can transmit it. And so what they're finding is that masks are incredibly powerful to change that, and especially N95 masks. N95 masks are those that they fit tightly, and what they do is they, uh, they block 95% of all airborne particles. And so they really make a huge difference protecting you and also protecting others. And so we purchased a supply of these N95 masks that offer this sort of maximum protection and we're gonna have them available. And if we need to get more, we'll get more. And they're for you to keep. Okay, so that's the first announcement. That's my only one. And uh, Ben's doing music this morning, so Jeremy's gonna tell us the other announcements. Good morning, we're so glad to have you in the building and at home. We're gonna go through a few more announcements. I'm back in the tech booth this morning uh, doing the live stream and some technical work, so it's good to see you. Um, our first announcement this morning is about the Labor Day camp out. I'm going to invite Ben to come up and give us some details about that. Thanks, Chair. So uh, Labor Day camp out, assuming uh, we're not chewing smoke at that point in time and it's not 115 degrees, uh, we're going to do it. Uh, just as a heads up, in addition to doing some good eating together, uh, it's going to be an Olympic themed camp out. So if you're a kid, there's going to be a kid version of the decathlon. And there will be one for older adults as well, which might contain activities like, have you seen my teeth? Or where's my hearing aid? So there will be activities for everyone. Uh, we encourage you to come out. We'll have, uh, we'll have times up there uh, next week, but yeah, we're gonna do a lot of good eating uh, and it's gonna be fun uh, to be together. You don't have to stay the night. You can just come out and enjoy the company too. Also, if you have any sort of shade structures that you'd like to bring out, even if you're not gonna stay here, I'm sure we would enjoy to have uh, some additional shade to sit under. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Our next announcement is Music at the Point, which is September 11th at 5 p.m. That's actually next Saturday. So we'll be having a fun evening of music out on the front lawn in front of the Ministry Center right out here on Saturday, September 11th. Now, um, you can bring your own picnic food for dinner. Uh, the church will also supply a hot barbecue that's available for anyone to use starting at 5 p.m. Uh, and then sometime after five, after the uh, food kind of settles in there, we're going to have um, a trio of flute, horn, and oboe doing a little classical music special, and then followed by a longer set by the PPUMC Praise Band. So it's going to be a nice evening. You should come out and join us. Just so you know, it will not be live streamed. It's not being recorded. So if you want to see it, you're going to have to come and participate and have some fun on the front lawn. It should be very, very safe. Next announcement, please. This Wednesday is GROW, starting uh, this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, you can look in your e-news announcements. They'll have all the links set up for that. And that will be led by Ben Harrell. And I think that's, oh no, I almost forgot the most important announcement this morning. Ice cream. Following worship, enjoy a cold treat at both of our services. This week is the Costco ice cream bar with nuts and the uh, icy popsicles, which are nut free. So, unlike our worship service, it's free of nuts. Just kidding. <laughs> are we all good? That's it, all right, so let's stand. We're gonna join in our first song this morning. Martin, can you go back one slide really quick? So in spite of what it says there, if you eat the icy popsicles, they do not have sickness in them, okay? We're gonna take the K out of them next time so they don't look uh, sick. All right, move forward, sorry. Uh, we're gonna sing a new song this morning as our call to worship, and I wanna give a little bit of context for it. So this has been a wild week 
there's been some terrible stuff going on. And one of the things that I continue hearing from people over the last 18 months is that they feel kind of helpless and hopeless. There's nothing that they can do themselves uh, to affect the kind of change that they want to see in the world. And so uh, this song called Stand in Your Love, um, it talks about not living in that fear, but but having faith in a God who has conquered everything previously. He's conquered death, and we can have, we can have hope in what God has to offer. So, um, yeah, we're going to sing about not, not living in that fear all the time. Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus said, do not judge others so, so that, that you, you may, may not be judged. judged. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but, but miss the log in your own eye? 
Don't be hypocrites. Focus on removing the log from your own eye. In our worship this day, Lord, help us to see the things that prevent our hearts from being close to God's heart. Amen. Let's not get too comfortable. Let's stand up again. Uh, if you're at home, check in on the, uh, on the YouTube chat, and you should be standing up as well. We're going to sing to the Lord. Uh, one of the important things in understanding who God is is understanding who we are because of who God is. So, so we're going to sing about it. Good morning. Good morning. From the message from Mark chapter 7, verses 5 through 8. The Pharisees and religion scholars asked, Why do your disciples brush off the rules, showing up at meals without washing their hands? Jesus answered, Isaiah was right about frauds like you. Hit the bullseye, in fact. These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they are worshiping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy, ditching God's command, and taking up the latest fads. So Jesus told the Pharisees that they were more worried about having clean hands than having clean hearts. Are we any different? When Jesus says stuff like this to the religious teachers, he's not doing it to be mean. He really is showing his love and care for them. Sometimes we all get off track. We may be washing our hands, going to church, getting good grades at school. The outside of our lives may be sparkling clean. But while doing all these good things, 
we might at the same time be thinking and saying and doing things that are hurtful and selfish and wrong. What Jesus is saying to all of us is, are your hearts clean? In your activity bags today, you have puzzle and coloring pages, crayons, and a pencil. And yes, it's not Valentine's Day, but you have a foam heart and a washable marker. Use the marker to write down or draw on the foam heart the things in your own heart that need cleaning. And then the next time you wash your hands, wash the foam heart as you ask God to wash your heart. And please just use the washable marker on the hearts, not on walls. Thank you for remembering to bring cans of food for people who are hungry here in Elk Grove. The food collection box is always on the turquoise table in front of the ministry center. And don't forget, you can pick up your very own activity bag anytime from the box on the turquoise table in front of the ministry center. Thank you. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, worship Your
Thank you, worship team. I want to go back to the last part of that song, the last screen. So this song, uh, Bless the Lord, O My Soul, also called 10,000 Reasons, has become uh, one of our very most loved songs at Shasta Camp. And at Shasta Camp, all the songs have motions and movement. And uh, I can, when I hear this song now, I see, you know, 40, 50 kids, bless the Lord, O My Soul, O My Soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. O oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And the visual component of that song at camp is as important as the words. The title of the sermon whoops, is This People Honors Me With Their Lips but their hearts are far away from me. So Jesus is confronted by a group of religious leaders that are condemning Jesus' own followers. For what? For not acting like religious folks are supposed to act. Why are your disciples not living according to the rules handed down by the elders? Our religious tradition, our beautiful, powerful, wonderful faith that we've been living out for more than a thousand years and, and you're disregarding that. You're eating food in an inappropriate way. You're, you're not preparing your, your, yourselves, your hands, your bodies to be able to, to receive from God. So the restifics that they are talking about relate to a number of traditions around ritual cleaning, many of them based on scriptures from the Torah. And, uh, and there's actually four big areas of these uh, sort of holiness laws. And here they are. And pretty much every Jew knew this. This was the faith, by the way. This is what people thought about. Tevilah was that religious washing and purification part. That was really big. In fact, when you went to the temple, they had these baths that were built into the, the gates of the temple so that you could wash. Then there was kashrut, and that had to do with kosher foods. Uh, food laws, not eating pork, uh, meat prepared in a certain way. Then there were all these laws around Sabbath, uh, laws that govern what you could and could not do on Sabbath. For example, no work. That was the biggest. And finally, Zizekah, uh, which was almsgiving and charity. All the laws that were concerning care for the poor, including tithing. Now, <laughs> I just want to put in a, a positive word on all four of these. First of all, uh, the first two, Tevilah and the kosher laws, kept the Jews alive for 4,000 years. That's right. And there were many times in history where there were pandemics, and guess who fared best through pandemics? Literally of any people that have lived on the earth. Jewish communities. That's right. During the Black Plague, the Bubonic Plague, the Jewish communities fared far better. It killed about half of the population in Europe, but only a small portion in Jewish communities. Why? Well, part of it had to do with their, their food laws and their purification and their washing. Sabbath, right? Sabbath laws. Sabbath laws represent the first six-day work week the world has ever known. That's right. Uh, 3,000 years ago, uh, the Jews put in place this idea of a day of, of rest, a day of, of worship, uh, a day not to work. And it wasn't just for the landowners, it was for everyone. The servants, the slaves, everyone um, essentially had that. We also know today that if we go 24-7 and we don't have downtime, we don't function very well. So Sabbath laws um, can be incredibly powerful and important. And finally, I don't need to say anything about the last one, almsgiving charity within Judaism, within Christianity, actually within all the great religions of the world, this is the thing that often makes the most difference in what people see. Uh, even right now, with disasters throughout the world, uh, the work of religious folks to care for those that are hurting is profound, profound. So, if you think that Jesus is, is simply condemning all of these things wholesale, you would be mistaken. He's not saying that. In fact, these can be incredibly powerful, all of them. 
He's not condemning them. What he is doing, however, is, is saying that we can live out these outward, external things, as good as they may be, and we can miss really important stuff. The other parts of our faith, the other parts of our religion, that's right. We can miss out if we, if we miss them. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on those things that when Jesus said, Isaiah really knew what he was talking about when he prophesied about you hypocrites. You have an outward appearance, the outward stuff, but then he wrote this, people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And then he goes on to say, nothing outside a person can enter and contaminate a person in God's sight. That's right, in God's sight. Rather, the things that come out of a person contaminate the person. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. So what Jesus is saying is your religion is not working if it is not bringing you closer to God. Yeah. And then he gets a little more specific. The problem is primarily not external, which you are fixated upon. It is primarily internal, which you are not paying attention to, to your detriment. And then what follows, <clears throat> well, actually, that's yes, right, okay. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> so the important thing to remember is Jesus is talking to us. We're religious folks. Here we are today, worshiping God. We're part of this thing called organized religion. I know organized religion gets slammed, but that's what we're about. And uh, would we be better off if we were disorganized religion? I never figured that one out. But anyway, um, yeah, we're religious people. He's talking to us. And so yet we have to be careful or our hearts might end up being very far from God. I don't know about you, but I'm a religious person. He's talking to me, and I don't want my heart to be far from God's heart. So what do we do? Well, what follows um, is, is kind of a list of different destructive, sinful things that come from within us. And, you know, it's a long list. There's 12 of them. And at the end of these... It says, all these evil things come from within, Jesus says, and they defile a person. Now, one of the things you'll notice throughout the scriptures, there are places where these lists of very destructive, sinful actions are described. And uh, about 100 years ago, uh, a uh, Lutheran pastor who became among the best-known theologians in the United States named Reinhold Niebuhr said, you know, there's a problem with lists. And the problem with list is anytime you get over about three or four things, it's like, oh, it's a list. And we stop really dealing with the things and it's just this list of stuff and it's, it's too big to really get our heads around. And so as a pastor, he was kind of frustrated with the problem with list, as good as the list may be. And so he thought about that and eventually it, it, it led to a sermon and, and then actually a book that he wrote um, that one of the things that's really helpful is if you look deeply at, at these sins, they really fall into two different types of categories. And believe it or not, understanding these two categories is really, really helpful in dealing with the stuff that we need to deal with. So one category of sin he called sins of sensuality. Now, sometimes we think of them as sexual sins, but it's actually bigger than that. But what they are is sins of the senses our eyes and our ears and our nose and our mouths and our, our, our ability to touch are the, the, the mechanisms that get us into them. Um, fornication, adultery, licentiousness, which is boundarylessness, and that can include things like um, you like, the, you like the, the way alcohol feels or, or the way drugs feel, and so you, know, you, you pursue that, and so that takes over. Wickedness, theft. I see something, I want it, right? My eyes see it, I take it. So sins of sensuality have to do with things that our senses crave in some way, shape, or form, and we, we, we succumb to that. However, that's not all types of sin. There's another type of sin, if you look at these lists, and they're sins of pride. We might use the word ego-driven. 
about elevating ourselves, wanting to appear a certain way, often by pushing other people down because that's an easy way to elevate yourself without having to do anything, put everybody else down. And so these things, greed, deceit, envy, slander, pride, folly, these things are, um, they're not so much through our senses, they're more that, that, that inner sense of, I want to be at the center of everything, I want to be the best, I want to be the greatest, I want to be the super whatever, even the super religious person. Now what he said was, unfortunately, these are hard to see. The top list, you know, we may hide those things from others, fornication, adultery, licentiousness, wickedness, theft, but it's really hard to hide them from ourselves. On the other hand, sins of pride are really tough because often we hide them from ourselves. We can't see them. We don't realize they're going on. We can't see our own greed. We can't see our own deceit. We can't see our own envy, our slander, our own pride, our own folly. Now, murder uh, was the, the other one, and the reason murder isn't put on one or the other because murder often is connected with both. Um, and, uh, but the same idea that, that, that things that we do and, and, and they have an outward component that we can see, those are generally that top half, but the bottom half are the ones we have trouble seeing. So what Niebuhr said is, is that the church and people of faith, it's often the bottom ones we need to focus on. The top ones we have to deal with And we often see those, but the bottom ones we can't. So what do we do? So what do you do, right? Fortunately, there's a secret weapon. That's right, we have a secret weapon for seeing sins of pride that we religious folks often cannot see in ourselves. So what is the secret weapon, ready? Here it is. Listen to the nuns. Now, (laughs) I love this picture. Now, it's not these types of nuns, but I, 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 I figured if, you, if, if I showed you this crazy picture, you'd remember it. It's these types of nuns. Listen to the nuns. It's talking about non-religious people. That's right. So even though the picture, it's, we're not talking about Catholic nuns, um, although they may have something to say to us too, but we're talking about non-religious folks. We're talking about folks that are turned off by religion. And there's lots of them, yeah. Last week, we looked at um, what came out of the census data Uh, and part of a a large scale looking at over the last 15 years of religious identification. And um, last week I I shared the bombshell that really shocked, it's reverberating throughout the religious world, is the white evangelical Protestant went from 23% to 14.5% and still trying to figure out what all that's about. But that's We talked about that last week. What I want to focus on is the part that wasn't the bombshell at all. Everybody knew this was happening, and that is the nuns, the unaffiliated. And they're the sort of purplish part of that, and they go from 16 to 23% over the last 15 years. But it's actually bigger than that. If you take a step back and look at really the last 30 years, 30 years ago, it was just 8% of the population. This is self-identification. This is the way people identify themselves. 8% of the population 30 years ago said, I don't want to be affiliated with any religion. And now it's 24%. It's almost tripled. Yeah. That's the fastest growing group. I guess you could say it's the fastest growing religious group, the nuns. So why are the nuns not interested in religion? Yeah. Well, one of the things that Niebuhr said about sins of pride is that we can't see them ourselves. But guess what? Other people often can. They often can. And if you listen carefully to people that see those things and often are affected by those things, you can learn a lot about yourself. And believe it or not, if you talk to the nuns, if you ask them, why are you not interested in Christianity? United States, that's the primary largest religion. Why are you not interested in Christianity? Why are you not interested in religion or the church? Many of them will tell you. 
they'll tell you. And so what I want to do is I want to share with you the top four things uh, from hundreds and hundreds of of little anecdotal statements. Um, There are four that I put together, and and I I want to sort of do this as a little bit of a, a, a meditation, okay? I want you... I want each of us to look at these and not think about, oh, yeah, I, that person out there, I know a lot of people like that. And yeah, no, no, this is, this is uh, thinking about our hearts and the way we work and maybe the way we act out in ways and we don't even realize it, but we're distancing our heart from God. The nuns have something to say. So let's do it. Let's look at it. The number one, far and away the number one, has to do with a perception of, of being legalistic and judgmental. So here's a, here's a statement, a very typical statement. My daughter's judgment and condemnation of others is brutal. It feels horrible when it is aimed at me. Yeah. Now, by the way, this knows no place in the theological spectrum. This could be a very, very conservative um, Christian, this could be a very, very progressive or liberalism. It has to do with intolerance of others that see things differently, and unfortunately, intolerance can be anywhere. It's brutal, though, when that happens. Now, with each of these, I'm going to lift up just one scripture. There are many scriptures that deal with this, but our call to worship scripture from Matthew 7, Jesus says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. And he says, you know, you hypocrites, you, you look for the speck in your neighbor's eye, but you miss the log in your own eye. So Jesus says, you know, when, when you do that, it, it, it doesn't bring you closer to God, right? Only God can judge. We can't judge, but we do. Now, so often, the reason it's hard to see this is because often it's just the way we operate. Yeah. We have a sense we're setting people straight. Yeah, when we judge them. You know, we can't even figure out what's going on in our own lives. When do we get this idea that we can figure out what's going on in the hearts of other human beings, but we do that? That's what judging others is. Now, sometimes it's not even words. Sometimes it's just a look. Sometimes it's kind of a head shake. But we let it know our disgust. You know how well shame works to change another human being? It is absolutely counterproductive. It actually propagates and fuels further (laughs) the very thing that we're condemning. So think about you, your own life. Are there places where for some reason you just can't withhold your judgments? You can't withhold those little stares or those looks of disdain. Think about the people that, that, that often are afraid to talk with you, afraid of that. Yeah, think about that for yourselves. <clears throat> I've got stuff to think about for me. Number two, to us and them, my mother knows she is saved and that everyone else who doesn't believe exactly as she believes, including me, is going to hell. Again, this knows no place on the theological spectrum. It can be anywhere. This idea that somehow I've got it and I know that you don't have it. Your beliefs are wrong. You see the world wrong. Um, Again, there's many scriptures that confront this, but I think the one that has always spoken to me the most is Philippians 2. Paul writes, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Your job is not to work out anyone else's salvation. Yeah, this is our own, our own salvation we work on, yeah. And when we get overly involved in the salvation of others, we often, unfortunately, end up creating an us and themness. Now, you may say, well, that's a lot like the first one, and it is, but this focuses on, on our sense of we've got, we've got it all. That's right, we've got it all. So we don't have to do that, uh, that uh, working out our own salvation more. We, we've, we've got that worked out, yeah. We've made ourselves, we've arrived, yeah. 
Are there places in your life, are there places in my life where my own sense of I've got it all together and boy, I can see all those people that don't. That's number two. Number three, hateful towards some groups of people. Yeah. Quote, even though my dad talks about how Jesus says to love one another, he really seems to hate some groups of people, especially fundamentalists and those who put up Confederate flags. Again, this knows no place in the theological spectrum. You can change it to, you know, really does hate um, uh, <clears throat> LGBT persons or Muslims or environmentalists or people that drive big trucks and put out a lot of pollution, right? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can find all sorts of different groups. <clears throat> of course, this is maybe the easiest one of all to talk about scripturally not being the way of Jesus. Jesus says in what we call the golden rule for a reason, it is golden. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. Yeah. Sometimes you're that group that someone else hates and how do you like to be treated? That's right. How do you like to be? Do you like to be treated with hatred? Disdain? No. No. So I'd like you to think about, are there groups of people that you hate? Now, we often don't say we don't hate any, we don't hate anybody. Are there groups of people that you prejudge? That's right. Often it's persons that identify with groups that someone in that group has hurt you. Yeah, someone in that group has hurt you and, and maybe wounded and maybe did something horrible. But you have stereotyped, which is prejudging, that's what prejudice is, and you've extended that out to the whole group. So the whole group is guilty of that, what that one person did. That's, of course, called judging too, right? Yeah. The bottom line is it, it, it has no positive effect on that group. Hating another group never, ever, ever is a blessing to that group. It brings out all sorts of horrible things, <clears throat> but it also distances us from God. That's number three. Number four, arrogantly claim absolute truth. My brother-in-law uses the Bible as a weapon. And when his bizarre scriptural interpretations class with common sense or science, he simply says, the Bible says that I believe it, that settles it. (laughs) The problem is not the Bible, it's the way we use it. The Bible is not a weapon, okay? Whenever the Bible is used to maim or wound or to show everybody that I'm right and you are wrong and you're to be condemned for that, that's an inappropriate use of the scriptures. There's lots of scriptures that I think uh, that speak to this, but the clearest one for me has always been 1 Peter 3, 15, 16. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Weapons are not, using weapons are not gentleness and respect. Yeah. The problem is, is that, is that one of the horrible aspects of this is that when we use scripture as a weapon, we often make the scriptures off limits to that person. Why would I be interested in looking at something that is a weapon? that has been used on me. And so it really almost seals a person off from um, wanting to have anything to do with your religion. That's right. And so think about, are there times that, that you use scripture or this absolute sense of I've got it all tight and wrapped up and I can, I can use that, I can use that as some sort of a lever or some sort of a weapon. What the nuns are saying is, is, is that really hurts. That doesn't, that doesn't do anything positive. And what Jesus is saying today is, is that distance your hearts from God? Yeah. So listen to the nuns, all right? Not the Catholic nuns, but non-religious folks, yeah. 
Almost all of us have relationship with non-religious folks. What would happen if you asked them, in almost a confessional way, what are the, what are the things that really hurt? What are the things that make uh, Christianity incredibly unattractive to you? Because we're religious folks. People are watching us. Yeah. We need to listen to what they're saying. Because we can honor we can honor God with our lips and end up, sometimes without even realizing it, being very far from God. Amen. So as was stated, um, as Ben stated, you know, this has been a, a really hard week. And there's so many things that are going on that are dark and heavy and have just images that have torn at us. And... I'm just going to lift up four that we're going to kind of focus on in prayer this morning. And some of these are very close to home and some of these are, are, are not. But in our community prayer in a moment, um, we're going to lift up uh, the Galt officer, police officer, Harminder Grewal, who was killed in a head-on collision. And his, his, his partner is still in the hospital, but he was killed. And um, he'd only been on the force two years and... Uh, he was loved and beloved by um, pretty much everyone he came in contact with, and his family is grieving, the Grewal family. I want to lift up the Caldor fire victims and firefighters, and you know, we're, we're seeing effects of that here at home, but think about the people that are in harm's way. Think about the people that have evacuated, or at this point, the folks that have had to leave, not because necessarily the fire is going to get them, but the smoke is just making, you can't, you can't breathe. Yeah, and people with any sort of respiratory problems, we're going to pray for that. And all the firefighters that are doing amazing work, um, the number of, of, of people that have died in these fires is incredibly low, considering the size of these fires. And the number of structures that have been destroyed is also very low, and that's because of the work of firefighters. Right now, Hurricane Ida is wreaking havoc, same place that uh, some of you went to uh, New Orleans and Katrina after Katrina to do that work and saw the devastation, and uh, there's deep concerns about that now, and a lot like Katrina, they didn't think it was going to be that big a deal, and then the next thing you know, it was a huge deal. These things, you never know how they're going to turn out. Sometimes it's not necessarily the wind, it's the storm surge and the rains that cause the biggest problems. And finally, Afghanistan. Yeah, the people of Afghanistan, all the soldiers that are there, um, all the people that worked um, with our government over the last 20 years. Um, what, a, what a difficult, painful thing to happen, yeah. Uh, the carnage this last week, the fears that that could easily happen again. Terrorism, terrorism is such a horrendous type of warfare because it's essentially unstoppable. So we're going to pray for that. So let's be in prayer right now. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a place to come. And even now we are grateful that... Uh, as we are inside, whether here in, in the great room or in our homes, that hopefully we are able to breathe, but we are certainly aware of so many right now that can't. Lord, at this time, that there's a lot of heaviness on our hearts, we begin by lifting up the family of, of Officer Harminder Grewal for his partner still in the hospital. We pray as that whole community grieves as we were reminded of those who serve to protect and often put themselves in harm's way. Lord, we pray for all that are being affected by the Caldor fire, including ourselves, but especially those that have been evacuated or those that are having great difficulty and distress in breathing. We pray for the firefighters. We pray that they will be productive, but also that they will be kept safe. We lift that up to you, Lord. We pray for all those in the path of Hurricane Ida. We pray for their protection. We pray that there would be guidance and wisdom that people that, that need to evacuate would do so. 
And Lord, we, we pray that there would be an outpouring of compassion on the effects of Hurricane Ida, particularly if it is profound, that we might respond with love and care. And finally, we lift up Afghanistan to you, the people of Afghanistan. Those um, from our country and other countries that have been there on what we call a peacekeeping mission in, a, in, in, in the midst of a civil war. Uh, Lord, we don't pretend to understand or figure out and sometimes we pontificate as if we knew exactly what is to happen. Lord, we pray that there would be a way through this that is free from further carnage. We pray for safety for all of those in harm's way, both those that are American citizens and those that we are seeking to reach out to that have, that have essentially worked with our country, especially over these last 20 years. We pray for our president that you would give him wisdom and guidance through this difficult, difficult time. Lord, all these things we lift up to you and together now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand as we sing ourselves from worship.
way out. Um, these N95 masks really are good. Uh, the effectiveness is beyond, you know, I think, I think one of the big difference between um, the Delta variant is its uh, transmissibility is, is, is greater. And there, these have been shown to have a, a significant effect. And so if, if using one of these is a benefit to you, please grab one on the way out. If we need to get more next week, we will. And we're going we're gonna to make these available um, in the box on the, on the turquoise table. So for any of you that, please think about using uh, one of these N95 masks. And uh, please bow for the benediction. Lord, in a world filled with, with much darkness, sometimes literally caused by smoke, but many other reasons as well, we truly do stand in awe of you and the instruments that you would have us be to that world. Amen. Grab an ice cream bar on the way out.